Let's go. Yeah, let's let's, let's go hot. We should just do a big, huge round of applause for me. Yeah, all right. That's what I'm talking about. Bring in those people from the back, right in the front. You guys got the best seats. So thank you for coming and making time to join us here at Adorama. I um, want to say thank you to them for putting on this event. They do a lot of great events. And actually, this is my first time live on, uh, at an Adorama event. So I feel really lucky. And thank you all for being here. <clears throat> the, the basis of me being here with my support team, uh, a couple guys from the Vitech group that can answer questions about the products, is to kind of give you insight into what we have to offer in regards to the Astras or the Astra Soft or the um, couple of other lights, including the Gemini, which is behind me and on the floor. So the value in understanding those lights makes it easier for you to make a decision if it's something that fits your need and maybe you're interested in using. Uh, we're hoping that they uh, increase the amount of Geminis available in the rental here because they're always gone. They're always out. So that's, that's our ambitions is for you, once you uh, enjoy seeing what you see tonight, to be able to go out and request it, try and use it. Kick the tires rentals is a great way to go because you can actually see if it fits your format or your style of shooting. Hey, how you doing? I said hi to everybody before. My name's Pat. What's your name? Nate. Hey, nice to meet you. So um, the, the cool thing about, um, about our company, not to prod too long until we get into some focus on lighting, is that we're uh, the founders. Uh, we all came from lighting. So we're all in the same ship, so to speak. We understand uh, the value of change. And that change went from film to digital and digital to high def and high def to 2K, 4K, and who knows where it's going to go from here. And in actuality, my, uh, my take on lighting is a lot different than everyone's. Uh, I think lighting's really personal, that you actually create your own style and look, whether you're shooting or working for the DOP um, as a gaffer or a key grip, somebody that's adjusting the light or, or bringing up comments to how it works. And I think that the market uh, in lighting has radically changed since we introduced light panels, which was really the first LED light um, out there in our original cinema ring light, and then our brick, and then in our one by one. And it created a sense of, uh, oh, this works. So we'll start to use it. And again, we do it with our bicolor uh, in our Astras and our bricks and other lights in our arsenal. And from that, different marketplaces pick different instruments. I think the most invaluable, hey, how are you? We left a seat for you right in front. I got my coffee, Pat. This is more, more important Thank you, buddy. to all Thank the 75,000 people stream watching at this second. <laughs> Don't go away. Um, to have uh, an idea of lighting and how it's dynamically changing. It changed from a, uh, an arc, which a carbon burning, a flame, creating a push of light through an arc, to uh, tungsten bulbs, to quartz bulbs, to the acceptance of HMIs, creating daylight instead of tungsten, which is 28 to 3200. Um, and in that instance, uh, you have now, with LEDs being accepted, this new genre of color and colors available, whether it's tape, whether it's uh, a Fresnel, whether it's a panel. And that is the acceptance, once again, of LEDs on another scale, another endeavor. And I think that the styling of lighting is uniquely changing as well. One, because of the sensor and the camera. And the lenses, you know, if you've got some Hawk lenses, they're 1.1 for anamorphic. I mean, that's incredible compared to what everybody's familiar with shooting with. You know, there's 400 back there, that's four, five, six split. So light is an important factor of getting through the lens in some instances, but we're finding that a lot of people are using less light or possibly what I believe is more reflective values. And in reflective values, that means that you may walk in and find somebody in a position that is actually working great because the way the sun's coming in and hitting the floor, and it's like, bring the camera and let's shoot right here. It's the constant of it and how long you can hold it. So you discover ways of using artificial light tools to kind of keep that light looking after it's gone over the house and, and into another part of the world. So um, I just I always love to get a gauge of who I'm talking to because I can keep it from being moronic and boring, which I, I did to my kids as they were growing. But um, 
Who here is a shooter? And who here is lighting, does lighting? And who here is a director? Anyone producing or editing? OK. So for the basics, we're going to kind of wade through that because you already know about three-point lighting and the French cross and all those different values. Um, what I'm here to say is that lighting being so personal that a lot of times I consider myself back in the day a dumpster diver, that I didn't necessarily always have a role of 1,000H or um, 216 or straw or something to use. And so I'd look for something laying around that would fit the need. Now, as lights were very hot back then, uh, traditional quartz lights, you couldn't put bubble wrap on it for the most part because eventually it would burn up or, or something along that lines. But now with LEDs, you've actually got a more unique value uh, of being able to use bubble wrap. It's no surprise that everybody's done it, right? Or being able to um, grab a packing crate and make it into kind of an interesting brownish um, colored bounce. Maybe you're shooting sodium vapor outside and that light reflected off, it's gonna give you some nice kicks or angles. And by reflective, it would be back here so you'd see it off my cheekbones kind of like shooting cars. Anybody shoot cars? Anybody tried to shoot cars? So car shooting is very difficult until you get it down, which is, you know, you don't really just light into uh, the side of the car. You light into something that you see reflected in the side of the car. And some people, yeah, just a sip of vodka. OK, maybe a gulp. Um, um, the reflection, instead of taking a square card, you're going to take your knife and you're going to cut a curvature to it, round it out, so that when you're looking at that card reflecting the side of the car, the light falls off. It doesn't come to an end. It falls off. It's really useful. So a lot of great shooters uh, of cars, Bill Bennett and a number of others, have always used that. We used to call the big light they build uh, this... Um, Sausage light, because it looked like you know the Oscar Mayer Wiener car uh, was popular in the 60s, and it would have a round edge to it. And so they'd make these, these boxes uh, with light going through them that were 25 feet long by 8 feet high. And they would always take black paper tape and always put a curve into the corners. And it just disappears. So no matter what scale size you're working on, that's a good, that's a good value. Now, we have the house lights on, right? Could we go to? Yeah, please. Oh, that shows my thickness of hair very well. So um, I'm sure there's a couple of questions you guys all have, and ladies, uh, I'll get, let me get them out of the way really straight. I'm uh, one of eight children. I'm right in the middle. I'm six foot seven. I'll be six eight November 16th. And I'm not going to take uh, advantage of any of the food they have back there because I'm trying to get back to my original weight, eight pounds, six ounces. It gets better, trust me. <laughs> so what we have is a situation where in a three-point lighting, um, we've got uh, the ability with panels or fernels back here to create either a nice hard edge. And by all means, take any of this the way you want with whatever pieces of equipment you're using. And uh, just go along with me if you know what I'm talking about. And the advent of uh, what we would call in traditional quartz world a 2K zip light, two 1,000 watt FCM bulbs into a holder, into a reflector of white that pushes the light out. So instead of having all that heat, our, our Gemini, for example, is giving you the ability of tungsten or daylight, but also in uh, various colors, HSI or gel modes. But to stay with lighting for a minute, uh, when I say that it's a point of uh, view, would you mind sitting in the chair for a second? Anybody know this guy? I do. Great. So Rich is sitting in for us, and we've got a couple of camera angles. So we're over here on the side. Uh, Rich, could you turn and look towards this gentleman? Okay, so um, we've got a Sola 4, which is a daylight fixture. And I'm going to turn that light off. And I'm going to 
pan this light around. And I'm going to, I'm going to dim this down. Where is it? Right there. So I can go, okay, I'm just going to go. That's our Bluetooth app, which is kind of cool because you can run it from your phone. So what do you think our camera lens is capable of seeing? What, what's the mark on? Is this a, a, a 1 to 8 or something as far as f? Uh, or? It's going to be a uh, 2 8. I just wanted to sit down amongst <laughs> you all. 2 8. We're going to add 2 8 on there. 2 8. So um, you know, for some people's take, that might be enough light. Actually, the background's too hot, but let's stay in parameters, uh, not color in the background, but on him. Um, and if that pounded, pointed to the ground, really, it's, it's, um, it's not really getting his face, per se, from the hard light. Do we think that that's a good level? Does anybody want to offer up their, we, I mean, is this a better level? Anybody want to put input in with me? We're trusting the monitor, which is dangerous because we don't know if these are calibrated, but let's say it's there. So I've got this separation in the background, which is really great. Finding a location where the background's already lit at night becomes a perfect backdrop to come in and supplement something for something. If we're on a long lens, we can throw it all as a spectacle, degauss, diffuse background. And, 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 and gravitate towards it. Where's the light coming from? Maybe you planted or set a street light in the master shot where you've been able to allow for that light to psychologically put in the person's mind that there's a light in there, I saw a light. So they don't, they don't think and worry about why is this light coming from below. Maybe you did a wet down. Maybe you didn't because you didn't have a, a budget. But I can take and create a little bit more edging with a back edge light to do a little bit more separation. The other thing for shooting to create depth of field in a long shot, you're doing great. To create more depth of field is you can take uh, a small light. Let's think about the old quartz uh, traditional tungsten lights. You can put a snoot on a tweenie or a baby. That's anywhere from 200 to 500 watts. And you could put it at the very end of the street and just point it back at the lens. So instead of going and lighting all the street or the edges like we had to do years ago when we were 50 or 100 ASA, now called ISO, you can create the depth by just putting something back there coming to the lens. And, and even still, if you had two or three, or maybe you've got some Christmas lights, stringing them on a C-stand 25, 30 feet behind the talent, uh, just at an off angle where they're out of the master or two shot, but on the single, which is a 300 mil lens, you got this cool little glitter happening back there. Has anybody ever tried that? Knows that trick? Anybody not tried it? Great. I love the fact that you guys are speaking up because it's, uh, it's honesty, and that's the best way to learn. I got Christmas lights. Do you want them? You got Christmas lights? Do you want them? No. Okay. Great offer, though. No worries. Who are you, sir? Does anybody know who this guy is? If you know him, you've been here before. This guy is a genius and a great photographer, by the way. Really excellent. It's the first time meeting him. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of getting around things. Now, we have different types of, uh, hey, John, where are those batteries? We have these cool little lights. I know, that was to get you to come up and do my work. Um, so let's say, for instance, this is, and this isn't a sales pitch, but the idea is to know that we have a full range of products available at different prices. And so you have L7 series batteries probably that you use with your cameras. This light is designed to accept L7 series batteries. Just so happens we have Anton Bauer's L7 series batteries. But something like this is equivalent to our first one by one flood as far as output. And it's not 12 inches by 12 inches. So what we can do is we can take something simple like this 
turn it on and actually use battery operation to create something that's going to be either uh, daylight or tungsten. Got a little screen on the back so you can see uh, what it is. And for some people, the better thing is when you're getting in close, I'll just take it down to 9% output. We can find something that works for the camera's position and just bring it in and find it. The, the biggest challenge is when everybody really wants to do their job and really do it quick and be efficient. And at the same time, the camera uh, man or woman is looking at the shot trying to see what light looks best, you know? Comedy, blinding them. Uh, dramatic. Uh, um, if you turn your head while I'm doing the lighting, I don't have a model. I've got a self-centered person. Just kidding. Um, da Vinci style, little triangle under. So just moving the light around a little bit, the freedom of that gives you the ability of saying, I kind of like it. Here, let's get a stand and let's grab it and put it in position. The ability to be able to dial the color in and out is going to be helpful also when you're playing with that's tungsten, that obviously is not. And if I'm that back, and it's, it's dimmed down way down, so it doesn't bother you guys' eyes, but uh, a little bit of a, an edge that's got a little bit of a difference to it, and then coming in with something just to create a stylized look. Now, this, close your eyes. I don't know if the lens will be able to handle it. This is really ugly. But for some people, this is cool. So what I'm getting at is when I talked about dumpster diving early, er, and when I was talking about dumpster diving earlier before some of you showed up, the idea was if you don't have it, look around. Maybe you'll find something to do diffusion with or bounce with. So this Lycos has uh, the ability of sliding the soft diffusion in it. And with that now, I'm going to have a softer source light. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, adjust the intensity down again. I've got a softer source light. But for some people, that's not soft enough because in actuality, the further away you get the diffusion or your topper or cutter or teaser, anybody know what those nicknames are for? It's a piece of grip flaggage to be able to go in and shape the light, give it like a hard shadow through it or something like that. So in dumpster diving, I like to tape the water jug I found to the light because I just created just a little bit of a mini uh, Shamira. And so with that, we just put the battery in it. And we're going to turn it back on. And I'm going to have a much softer looking light to be able to do it, right? So warmer, cooler, maybe just right about there. Or if I want, I could have it uh, underneath. Obviously, too bright for my choice. But sometimes on the older gentlemen or women where there's a little bit of aging, we want to we want to give them a little bit of extra love. Maybe we can't do it all entirely from the lens and overexposed by, you know, an eighth or a quarter of a stop. Um, maybe we can't um, put a black pro mist and a soft effects two on the lens to make it softer over together. But the idea is knowing ahead of time it needs to be softer, looking around to see what you can find to make up for that difference. Any questions? Jokes? Comments? Oh. Well, you guys can all pull chairs. Yeah, John. So Rich is wearing a hat. Like in an interview setup, is there anything that you might do differently? Put the light somewhere so you wouldn't have the shadow kind of come across the face? Well, I would try and position him for a darker background. Can you repeat the question for watching? Oh, for people listening and watching at home. So because, John, because he's wearing, Rich is wearing a hat, is there anything we can do to light that? and make a difference. I would never ask them to take their hat off. They may be like me and not want to show it. And so the idea is I would position my camera and ask to position them into a darker background instead of a bright football field. Something where that background value comes down so maybe I have a, a chance of bringing in a fill card or even something like that to just add something to it. The more, in, in my mind, uh, a more important thing uh, with images, remembering that every story is told in the close-up. So it's about emotions and effects. You need some sort of catch light, which this light is doing in his eyes, even though it's a low light level, to bring out that message you're getting through when it goes in for the tight close-up. Surprise, wide open eyes, tears in your eyes, sad. 
embarrassment, everything blushing around those blue eyes or whatever. Uh, it, it's really more important to have something in their eyes. It's better to be underexposed than overexposed because you can always go in and sell whatever light effect you're doing once you're into a closer shot. Does that make sense? So uh, another thing is the teaser I was talking about. I don't have a grip truck. So I took uh, a bunch of newspapers and put it together with tape, and that created my teaser. So actually, right now, I can keep this light out of your eyes and not have it affect the shot other than being seen in. But in, in reality, if I was to come around, I could shape that light from hitting the top of his head and just have it on the shoulders. Now, I know somebody's saying, Pat, you just put the stand in the shot. But that's the best way to get a laugh on the set and your last day. But uh, I'm just doing it to show you because we're kind of in tight quarters. Um, the other opportunity is being able to have something that's uh, battery powered and mobile. So um, you saw me doing the changes on this wirelessly. So from the camera, I can adjust the backlight on the talent that we had to rig on a pipe overhead and hide the 12 foot ladder offset. Suddenly your client that you're filming uh, walks in and the photo they gave you uh, to light by an insight into how they looked was 25 years ago and there's no hair left on their head. So you want to take that down, you can do it wirelessly right from the camera. That's where wireless and then battery options is really powerful. Uh, the LEDs aren't using that much power. This is 100 watts worth of power. So I can run it off a, um, a 90 watt amp hour for almost one hour, right? 90 divided into the wattage gives you the run rate. And for instance, this Gemini on the floor, compared to this one here, this is plugged into floor power. Now this, is, this Gemini is run on a 25 pound VCLX camera battery. It will run this light for an hour and a half at full output. And the value of that becomes when you're running to get a shot at the end of the day in a magic spot and you don't have a cabling crew and you don't have a generator, having a battery of some sort to be able to work from is why everybody's going to LED. And a lot of people are, are still staying with traditional light because that's kind of, that's their mark. That's their, that's their ink spot. They, they love just how a quartz bulb feels on the skin, just like a fluorescent tube for some people has kind of too much of an electric feel to it compared to um, um, other types of lights. So what we've discovered in trying to create lights for different users, and there's a lot of different users out here tonight, um, is the idea to see and know what these lights are capable of or how to look at just one lighting scenario for um, taking Richard to another level as far as his look. So again, I'm going to take this one, which is an Astra Soft. And um, this is like the, sh uh, like the Gemini. It's got a soft diffuser built into the front. And it's daylight or tungsten, not HSI as well. But when you're talking about having to grip or get a big enough water bottle to cover this, suddenly this has a really great ingredient to it, which is the ability to have a diffuse light at, I think that's at uh, about 10, what's that at? 20? 20%. Thank you, I didn't have to put these on. Uh, so 20%. The value that I could get out of it in much stronger lighting positions actually plays in really well. I think a lot of people aren't familiar with this light. They're familiar with the Astra 6X bicolor because it's kind of become the go-to light if you're trading up from your older panels because of the output, six times brighter than the original one by one, which means that it's five times brighter than that Lycos I showed you. Questions, concerns, recipes, stories? No. All right. Thank you. John, come on in. Come on up. All these models to stand in for you. Have a seat. Great. Let's change to another camera, please. So, I don't know. What's this one? Well, this one is your wide. 
That's the wide. Right, so from a different point of view, uh, in a wide, we're seeing it, right? Obviously, way too overlit. Would you mind dimming that down there to, I don't know, 5%? Does anybody like the teaser? Teaser light idea? Anybody? You old timers, do you guys like it? I was doing a film called Gosford Park with Robert Altman in England. Anybody see Gosford Park? It was uh, uh, time travel to the 20th and uh, the 20s. And it was funny because I showed this trick to the English crew. And I came in uh, a week later um, to one of the sets they were doing while I was pre rigging with some other guys. And they ended, up, uh, they ended up using all the page three girls. <laughs> and our, does that help your eyes? And so, um, what was the name of Maggie Smith, right? Maggie Smith walks into the set, and I'm standing there just going, oh my gosh, guys. And she says, nice touch, Pat. <laughs> but not tomorrow, OK? <laughs> all right. Um, so with something this soft, the ability to be able to adjust the dimness down is a really cool thing. Who works with sky panels? Who's played with sky panels, rented sky panels? Who owns sky panels? Great. Honesty is a great thing. A sky panel has been out for three years, and that product is a game changer for a lot of people because such as the Gemini, the Gemini is a two by one soft light. And what our light does is really unique. We on all of our units that are bicolor have taken daylight chips and we've taken um, tungsten chips. Those are full spectrum chips. So when we dim, we're dimming into daylight or into tungsten, we're actually taking one level up and one level down, one level up, one level down. And the spectrum shift is minimal when we're doing that and dimming. Some manufacturers think that actually using RGB to create daylight and a tungsten chip is more advantageous. We disagree with those because what we do is we use a daylight chip and a tungsten chip, and then we use RGB to create plus or minus green or any of the HSI wheel of color. And so when you're dimming daylight on ours, it doesn't fluctuate when you get to about 15% of output. It doesn't stop dimming at 10% and finally shut off at zero. The light dims down to 0 0.01. The Kelvin change between full output and 0 0.01 is only 100 Kelvin verified by an independent source. And the value with that is your color is not shifting. The Gemini is 22 pounds, 22.2 to be exact, and competitors are double the weight. The Gemini has one power cable that runs to it, not two. The power supply and everything's contained within it. I'm not here to talk about the price, but this is a less expensive product. And the value with the Gemini is that one is plugged into a battery. I can run it for one and a half hours at full output. But also, the light stays at 100% full output. It does not variate and drop to half output based on being on battery power. So with that in mind, a lot of people are gravitating towards the Gemini because of the added bonuses of it. But when we were talking earlier about the practicality of shooting these days, it's more about mobility and weight and ease of operation. So running on a battery is important. Full spectrum daylight or tungsten is important. The value of getting colors is a bonus. But the mobility of it is, in fact, a big thing. Traveling with it, loading it, rigging it, cabling it. So there's a lot of value in the fact that the Gemini is fitting a need for a broad market. So in the, uh, in the hopes that you take away from that interest, 
Get in touch with Adorama's rental department. Ask them for a Gemini. Uh, hopes that uh, there's one uh, available to you as we're wrapping up tonight. You can come up and play with the controls a little bit more. I think we're about 45 minutes into our broadcast now. 30. 30. All right. Um, so the reason I brought John in is because the value in um, the value in having a different source and a different camera position is nothing's really different from what we did before. It's find where the light looks best and mark it as your key. Your key could be a fill and still called a key simply because you're playing off the dynamics of this edge that he's getting. And so on the fill side, maybe this wants to be the two to one ratio. That's one stop under this exposure, which is two stops over. Does that make sense? And in the, in the, in the belief that this looks good, it can always be better because there's a lapse of kind of a, um, um, what would we call it, John? Shadow, dynamics. Does it, does it look like uh, maybe if we were to bring this on as a, a stronger key from the side and we were able to actually come in from the ceiling and shape soft light. Now this is a not a soft light, but the idea would be that we can come down and we can take some of this light off of his, off of his eyes, right? We could tip it up for a little bit more intensity. And we could also go in to get a little softer because it's a multi-surface. If I had a soft box on it or a wheel, I could. Maybe we want to take a a razor knife and just find that right angle for John's look. It's not, it's not easy being up here in front of all these professionals trying to show them something new, but I don't think I have yet. So where is that cut? Too many shadows, unless the shot recalls headlights looking through a picket fence, right? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to change something real quick. We're going to take this and we're going to turn it off. And we are going to unplug this. Now see, if I had a battery hooked up on this plate, on this stand, I could pretty much go wherever I wanted to go. Thank you, sir. I'm sure glad the Grammys were last night. Paper. Now this is obviously um, so hard without a mobile camera, but we're doing the best we can. Now I can take uh, some clear tape. JLAR is right there on top. Now this is obviously playtime when everybody's out doing the makeup in here and you've already lit the set, but you're like trying something new. I can take JLAR. Anybody know where the name JLAR came from? Developed by a guy named JLAR. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Okay, this isn't gonna work. Um, I can't get this to, oh, did I get it? I got it. So we just want to put this on John's eyes right about here. <laughs> Stay with me, friends. Great. You have a Sharpie? Yeah. If you had to pay for this, you would have been like, I want my money back. 
I'm just going to do some rough squiggles through there. And I just toned it down a little. Does anybody remember what it looked like before? OK. It's a trick in a box. It's something that you can pull out at the last second. You can run it as a teaser across the ceiling. So somebody's running a boom in, and they have no way of getting in because you continue to flat light the set. Um, the idea being that we can introduce a little bit of so I, I really like bounce light because I think we're into more of a reflective world of lighting nowadays than ever, simply because the sensor sees everything. I mean, we're working at eight foot candles and oh, turn it down. So with that, thank you, bud. We can do um, basically three points of light. Does anybody want this to go lower as far as intensity? Anybody want that to go lower? Does anybody want to go to a really hard look on John because they don't like what this turned out to be? Uh, this, is, this is where if we had more chances of getting Deeper, Da Vinci, cross light, intensity, down, let's go, let's go. I was dimming it, not dimming it, I touched the wrong one, right, right about there. Can we go back to this camera? Oh, that is that camera. Can we go back to that camera, John, look here. Yeah. You want me to add the camera? Yeah, look at the camera. So flat light, some of you, Understand the term flat light, it's just too frontal. So being able to come around with that light is making it uh, real advantageous. And then finding out maybe you don't bring it on all the way, you just bring it on a little bit. It's still too bright. Still too bright. It's just too bright. And it's too flat. Look at that gentleman right there. John, uh, look more that way towards that light. There you go. It's just flat to the camera, so it doesn't matter how you're going to light it. So knowing where the camera position is going to be to the talent is really helpful. You've done a great job. Save yourself. Um, any questions? Who wanted a really cool trick they were going to learn tonight that they didn't know? Like how to drink vodka without anybody really knowing. <laughs> What was the trick? You thought I was joking. What was the trick? What were some of the ideas? Let me have a, a synopsis or a, an idea of a situation somebody's been in and they felt like they got rushed and they didn't really understand the opportunity of how to light it. Is there a lighting scenario that somebody maybe you're working on, uh, school, classes, on your own? Anyone? How's that? Live events. Live events. Right, so live events, you mean like where people pay money to go see? Yeah, big crews, a lot of trucks and trailers. Oh, keeping me in the light, yeah. Um, the question was, you know, uh, live events and how, how would you light a live events? The easiest way to have a live events uh, lit properly is a great LD. And the idea is knowing how many camera positions they have, just like shooting a football game, and how many positions those cameras need to be in for the, the best shot. It's kind of like every concert is going to have the best shot, which is a close-up of the lead singer singing or the opera star singing or what have you. Um, anybody watch the Grammys last night? I thought the exterior lighting of the set was better than the lighting on the people. Anybody else feel that way? It felt muddy, which is, I guess, the fact that they held it in in Madison Square Gardens, which is a real high hang point, meaning the ceilings are really high, and getting the light in the positions uh, for that. Uh, some people may say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but the background and the sets were more beautifully lit than the people. And uh, that's a really hard part of, of uh, live events. And I probably really upset somebody out there that was involved in that lighting-wise, but I'm sure the crew just kicked you-know-what and did the greatest job they could. 
the, the, the idea with a live set or reality TV, cross-light. Cross-light, cross-light, every corner. If you're in a big room, cross-light up there, cross-light in that corner, cross-light back here, cross-light right back here. In, in essence, at that point, it could be soft cross-light, it could be a hard cross-light, you could have a center cross or a key, but the idea with cross-lights is you always have something coming back across the person, which means that if they're in a two-way conversation, it's going past them and lighting the person they're talking to. It's the safest, easiest way to do it. You could do it with fluorescence, keno flows, you can do it with LED strips, you can do it with 2K soft lights, you can do it with a number of different products. And, and that becomes the simplest way of going into a bigger space and setting up lighting. Because it's going to be very forgiving being that far back and being wide and soft. Were you going to ask a question? I was going to ask if it's because the, uh, the, the, the stage light or the, the, the background lighting was closer to the actual is from the background versus, or was it also hung as well? Well, I wasn't there. Yeah. But everything I gauge is what I see. So yeah. I watched it on a television until I had to go to sleep. Um, but I heard it went till midnight. The, you know, the, if you're lighting for education, uh, don't light off a perfectly balanced man, uh, monitor in your studio. Go over to a computer and look at it. Don't trust the waveform machine. Look at it on the computer screen because that's where people are watching it from. I think in education, they teach everybody about waveform machines and how to really judge the balance to it. And I think if you know that that material is only going to be on the web or on somebody's monitor, if they're lucky enough to have that big of a monitor, you need to use that as your platform for what's allowable and what's not. So I've been to many locations around the world where they lit via the waveform. And the lighting, they couldn't figure out why it wasn't looking good. And the reality is once we turn that off and lit to their monitors or to their screens because it was a political, it was you know, government, and it was piping out to government facilities. That's what they're watching on, so light it for that. If you're lighting a feature, you're not lighting it for the small TV. You're lighting it for a 75-foot screen. Great question. So the question came up to me about how would you light uh, theater lighting, so to speak, where there's multiple people, adults and children, in costumes, and how you would light for that. There's two points of view. Daylight spectrum is a better spectrum for white balance because most of the monitors are white, uh, are white balance to 6K, 6,000 Kelvin. And uh, the sensor, most sensors are anywhere from 55 with reds to uh, 59 with Sony's. They're all within the 5,000 to 6,000 range. And yet a lot of people love tungsten because it has a much smoother essence to it visually. We're all accustomed to tungsten lighting. Can we go back to these off for a second? So this is tungsten lighting as far as a warmer tone. And even if I tip this up just a wee bit more, um, the value of that. Now, what am I leaking into? That's a daylight fixture that's lighting me here. So because the imbalance in colors, um, it's, it's uh, more or less people will end up between the two. So 4,700 Kelvin seems to be a very popular uh, white balance. People will take Kina flows and they'll take two daylights and two tungsten so they can split the color range and have it more of a, uh, a muted pastel with that 4700 Kelvin. And I think also if you're looking to light um, a studio environment, and I bet there's several people in here who know, so it's always a good thing where people mix it up and talk after these events. Um, in terms of uh, creating a backdrop, which is either going to be white wall or brick or whatever it's going to be, a white, you can overexpose the white so that the talent actually has some separation that's dominant. And last night, that's what I thought the problem was with the lighting in the Grammys. The lights either couldn't get low enough to get really 
dig into the different skin tones that were on the set unless it was a super trooper follow spot. And so if you create a backdrop that is either going to um, uh, be a bit overexposed from what theirs is, and you have more than one camera, suddenly if you're shooting down the line of these dancers in their costumes, you've got this real beautiful reflective value from that, that wall coming to them if the camera's looking this way or coming to them from here if they're looking that way. So that, that backdrop for some camera angles becomes your key light. And then you're obviously going to uh, throw some light in. If you kept everything at just tungsten, no color or anything, the elegance of one color tone is very noticeable compared to um, the elegance of several different colors being costume related. So it, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Maybe uh, some clip lights from um, Home Depot, put a bulb in it and just use it to look from your vantage point of where your camera's going to be to see what direction the light looks best. And you may find it's raking, or you may find four lights, one in each corner, cross-lighting into the center. Which brings up uh, green screen. So I think, um, and I've, I've got about 40 years lighting experience, professional lighting experience. Doesn't mean I know everything, but I know that in regards to green screen, I've seen the change where green screen, if you were off an eighth of a stop, you had to light that positioning, where people were using three different gels between two you know, pieces of glass, like something you'd put under a microscope, and you'd look through the different color tones to see what's visible. And actually, the best way for you to look at contrast may not necessarily be to look uh, through a contrast glass, but use your smartphone and, and look back at the set Oh, there you are. Because you'll actually see highs and lows. And, and so instead of pulling up your jewelry and looking like uh, somebody else, you, you can actually look back. Better to be underexposed at over. If you see a bright light, you'll notice it right away. Because the eyes adapt to lighting very quickly, and they kind of drown in the light. So they're not as, uh, you're, you'll let things go. But if you just want to take a quick check, and if you've got a contrast glass, use a contrast glass. But a lot of times, it's only for clouds, so it's too dark to look out on a real set. But this works great. Great little trick. You enjoying this? OK. So going back to your green screen, yes, sir? Sorry, so that's, you're looking at the object screen, looking at what the light's on. Yeah, so I, what, the question was, I'm looking, how am I doing that again? So let's see, where's, uh, for viewers at home like us, See that screen? Yeah, I'm pointing at that. I'm, I'm looking at my reflex. See that screen reflected there? So the screen's off. And I hold it up at a 45 degree to my nose. And I look back at the set. So if you pull your phone out, do you have a phone on you? Hold it. Yeah, if you hold it off of your nose and tip it at a 45 degree, you can see all the way down there and see those people, that person that's putting that camera in their pocket. Hey. So if we're talking about green screen, what I was saying is uh, it's become a lot easier to light green screen than it used to be. And so the idea, um, the idea with green screen, I think, for lighting nowadays, because you can go digital or chroma. Who knows the difference between digital and chroma? If you don't know. Pardon? Well, yeah, so the, the, the chroma green has a denser color to it, so it absorbs more of the light which plays into what's reflecting back. And then you've got the digital, which is a more reflective material, kind of a lime green sometimes. And, and that has a more reflective value, so you don't have to put as much light on it. I always suggest to those that are trying it for the first time or want to check this out, is think of the talent in front of the green screen as a matchstick or a thumb. And if I take this volume of light and I light past them, 98% of the light goes to the screen. So I would always suggest lighting the person and then seeing how much light you need to add to the green screen. Or maybe you have to run a teaser down, real one if you don't have newspaper, and, and adjust that background. Because the switching systems or the software that a lot of cameras are offering these days does an incredible job of pulling a mat. And so the the challenge is if you light the green screen and then, okay, talent comes in and now you light the person, 
all that light, unless you spend a ton of time shaping that light, all that light's going back there. So now it's like, it was perfect before they came in. So the idea would be try lighting the talent first instead of the green screen. And as far as when weather decorum, news in the morning pointing to the clouds in the sky, you know, they're looking at their monitor on the side of the screen or they're looking at the monitor on the side over there. The idea is that most people want to have, um, I'm going to turn around because I've got a bad arm, but um, usually an arm's length. Um, so normal sized person, that arm. But that far away from the green screen. But what ends up happening is, you know, there's a sandbag there or a line for them to walk. It's like, okay, over here, that's because they had a hard night last night. And the next morning they just need something to brace themselves on. Only in California, not here in New York. So the idea would be you would set a light, something about this size, so you can control it from adding more green. So you catch them at that position. So when they're looking over, they've got a, a light on them, and it turns into an edge light when they look back at camera. Does that make sense? And that when there is a light coming from the up, opposite side, it's actually acting as an edge to help pull. Now, if you've got a studio, and you're um, lit with uh, the green screen lighting, and you notice you're getting a lot of um, green fringe in the hair, one of the things you could do is just simply add some minus green gel to those lights. So you're, you're adding anti-green to the light. They're getting green from the screen. Make sense? Yeah, well, I think at that point, their uh, camera balance is perfect from my estimates. But a valid point. There's a disagreement in the audience, and I would love to hear it. And so I'm going to mention what you brought up. The only problem is then the talent is getting uh, a minus green on them. Um, my my uh, disagreement to his disagreement is purely professional. I think that you have to trust your eye and gauge it. If you only have a... Um, a half magenta, and you only need a quarter, that's going to be a challenge because then you're overexposing more than the green reflection is. So it may not work for every situation, but having an eighth, quarter, half, or full magenta in your gel room, give it a try. It could be that that actually neutralizes some of the green. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, if it's a larger green, and again, these are just my own opinions. Nobody said they're in stone. In a, in, a, in a lighting environment where you don't have a lot of money for lighting, it's easier to have a digital because you're getting a higher reflective key off of that mat. If you're doing something which is super sensitive and you have, uh, you have a kayak system instead of a, uh, a new track, uh, our new tech, you, you, you have the ability to have a little bit more control. And so maybe somebody wants to have a, a denser green because there's a lot of swords flying through or silver helmets or different things like that. It, it, every, every type of lighting situation changes from local cable channel or own personal webcast or, or what you might be doing. You know, the amount of work expands to fill the time allotted. The bigger the set, the more equipment may be needed. But in a, if we're talking about a traditional, um, very small studio, a 12 by 12 or an 8 by 8 green screen, not a 60 or 80 by green screen, I personally prefer digital. And it just means that I can just light the talent, and for the most part, my switcher or my software can pull a good mat. It's, it's, a, it's very challenging because um, just what the variables are between a Sony system that's supplied to you with the camera compared to something that's thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. Yep. Yes, sir. This has nothing to do with green screen, but um, when you're shooting someone uh, against a bare light or brighter background, yes. do you have any tip on how to make the lighting more natural? Because over time, the subject looks like a sleeping torch. Uh, yeah. 
So the question was about lighting someone against a bright white background, kind of like an infinity set, right? And then how you could light the talent uh, so it doesn't look like it is fake. And so, um, depends on how much movement's gonna happen in the shot. Because if it's a talking head, it's very easy to overexpose the background and come in with soft lights to light the people. Uh, a backlight to create some separation, maybe even edges from both sides to separate them, but not all of them at full spot and intensity. It's kind of an eye judgment. Um, the, the other case may be where if it's a, um, um, a pizza commercial or a car commercial where you have this very large white psych, floors are white, and uh, you have white walls, um, you know, 100 by 100 silk overhead with space lights into it or um, 10Ks, something that's going to have enough volume and, and matrix to actually build the exposure up that's coming down. That'll filter out onto the floor. That will bounce up into the walls. And maybe you have some sidelines of lights with 10Ks through 12 by or 20 by grids. So let's take that back to a more practical size for somebody that's doing something on a smaller scale. Um, if you can set something of uh, a half to a stop and a half overexposed in the background, you should probably be able to pull a pretty neutral background and uh, then just come in with whatever style you're trying to light, whether it's a hard light with a Fresnel or whether it's soft, whether you're going to let the key side fall off on the shadow side, maybe you add another edge light to separate them. If it's, if it's standing or if it's walking, it starts to expand. It's going to be further out with another edge light. Or depending on if you have two cameras, I always like to light to the look. So if I'm looking at you as the camera, I want something in line with my eyes so that um, I've got something happening there. Uh, sometimes people will put in a bounce light off the floor like this is to help fill in. Um, and I think experimenting is the best way. Um, there's nothing like going to the hardware store and getting some work lights and trying to figure out uh, what output. If you put a 200 watt into the reflector for the background and you try a 100 watt maybe with a, a house dimmer so you can look at the levels you're getting so you can understand where the lights have to be and then judging from that what the equivalence is in lights that you're looking at if they're LED or traditional quartz lights. Does that make sense? Anyone else? How about you back there, sir? Any questions? Wake that child up. Um, where are we at? Who would like to understand how the uh, Gemini works? Did anybody come in to look at the Gemini? OK, great. So let's do this in formality. If you want to know how the Gemini works and you can't see the screen, come in closer. So if you want to get out of your chairs and come up, Let's say goodbye to the live stream. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. But if the live stream knows, there's a screen back here that you're going to be able to see. Okay. Right? Uh, oh. So come on up if you want to learn about it. We've got two lights here. We've got a couple of people that know the rundown on how these work. So step up and I'll.